Hello and welcome to the fifth episode of the Strength Coach Roundtable on the Row Perfect Rowing Chat podcast. I'm Will Ruth and I'm joined once again by fellow rowing strength coaches Blake Gourlay and Joe DeLeo. Plus we have special guest Sarah Hendershot on as well. Before we do some brief introductions, I'd just like to say to Blake and Joe, boys, happy anniversary. A year ago this Valentine's Day we aired our first episode of the Roundtable, so isn't that sweet? Um, anyway, so our last podcast was way back in October. Uh, so Blake and Joe, if you guys can bring us up to speed on what you've been doing over winter, any new projects or courses you've done, that sort of thing, and then we'll have Sarah introduce herself, and then we'll get underway with our topic. Uh, Blake, you want to start us off? Yeah, thanks for the anniversary uh, wish. I appreciate that. <laughs> I was hoping for roses, but I guess I'll take that. Um, I'm still coaching at the Lost Gas Rowing Club, um, still working on uh, training my private clients, and I'm just kind of trucking along over here in, in California. Right on. Joe? Um, yeah, pretty similar to Blake. Just work, continuing to work with private clients. Uh, did some consulting in the fall uh, with the Naval Academy lightweight team and then was back again uh, about two weeks ago to do a second private workshop with them. And then I uh, had the pleasure of attending the Joy Sculling Conference in early December, uh, which was a really great event. A lot of good uh, perspective and insight from you know multiple angles of the sport. You know, strength and conditioning, biomechanics. Um, so some really good guest speakers. And then uh, this weekend, heading down to Florida for uh, Dr. Stuart McGill's uh, seminar, two-day workshop. So learning the latest on spy, spine biomechanics research and how we can uh, better apply that to rowers. Very cool. And Sarah, welcome. And if you can go ahead and introduce yourself and give us a brief uh, rowing, coaching, educational background. And uh, yeah, go ahead. Sure. Uh, yeah, thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here, guys. Um, but so yeah, my, my background is, um, you know, I started rowing when I was in high school. I rowed for Simsbury High School, ended up at Princeton University, rowed there for four years. Uh, when I graduated, decided to keep giving the rowing thing a try, and I uh, joined the national team in 2010. Uh, got to go to a couple of world championships, um, got to win some golds there, which was really cool, and then made the 2012 Olympic team in the women's pair and finished fourth. Um, and then from there, that's kind of where my journey gets a little different. I tried on for another cycle, um, was going to see if I could give either the eight or the pair another go. Um, and in about 2014, started to get really riddled with injury. And that led me down this whole different path of exploration into essentially body movement and strength training and injury prevention. Um, and took that into my training all the way through 2016. Ended up just missing the uh, Olympic team for Rio and have now landed in Boston where we are taking a lot of the lessons that I've learned over the last cycle and applying it to other rowers. Um, right now we've, we're working on a um, project called Rowficient where we're uh, working with a few different, you know, a handful of individual rowers, some rowing teams, um, and now actually even spreading some of our rowing knowledge to the CrossFit world as well. Um, and we're doing that out of a gym in Boston, um, CrossFit Back Bay, and uh, have started to teach row fishing classes and actually develop their whole gym's endurance program. So, uh, you know, teaching, teaching those who don't know how to build an engine and build capacity how to do that. Uh, so it's been a lot of fun and a lot of good stuff over the last six months. Very cool. And there's a lot of those... Uh, CrossFit fail videos out there of various things. So hopefully you will be able to fix some of the uh, rowing technique stuff that gets put on this. <laughs> yeah, it all comes down to coaching, right? Like yeah. if you're, if you're going to get that good coaching, you can avoid those fails. <laughs> uh, so again, my name is Will Ruth of strengthcoachwill.com. I'm finally now getting around to posting a few new articles and videos on my site after a lengthy break while I shifted my focus away to uh, school and coaching. Um, so I'll have those coming out in the next few weeks. So uh, today we're discussing the psychology of performance and developing a mindset for success in rowing. Uh, we'll discuss why mental skills are an important part of rowing training and competing and provide some actionable strategies that you can immediately put into your own training. Uh, mental skills are also useful beyond your sporting career. So we'll also share a few times that these have helped us on our own lives uh, outside of sport. 
Um, I'm really excited for our podcast today for a lot of reasons. Um, my undergrad degree was kinesiology with a focus in sports psychology, and I'm taking psychology of athletes right now in my uh, master's in sport coaching program at the University of Denver. So it's an area that I'm passionate about um, academically. And then also my team, I know Blake in California, this isn't what you guys do, but uh, we are on an all eight week um, indoor erg and weights program to get ready for spring 2K time. So um, it's a it's a tough program and it's been a great opportunity for me to be able to push the importance of developing and honing my team's mental skills. So it's been fun for me to have kind of all this background information academically that then I can then put into practice and see them kind of uh, try and fail and fix and develop so that not only they can perform more effectively, but then I can also coach it more effectively in the future. So um, yeah, unless you guys have any kind of first comments, we can go ahead and get into it. And uh, the first question that I had was, what constitutes a strong mindset and why is it important for rowing? Uh, Sarah, you want to start us with that? Sure. Uh, what constitutes a strong mindset? Well, so, I mean, I would say, first of all, the reason why I think it's important for rowing is obviously because <laughs> rowing is a very difficult sport, right? Um, it takes a lot of pain tolerance and a lot of in and day in and day out grind uh, training in order to really improve and get to where you need to get. So mentally, you need to have an have a mindset that's going to be able to help you to improve through those tough situations, but that's also going to help you to push when the going gets tough, when the pain really starts to set in and everything in your head is telling you to stop. Um, and I think really there's two types of a strong uh, psychology in a rower and there, there's that strong psychology that comes from your training in day in and day out, the kind of person and athlete that can show up and really perform on a day-to-day -day basis and get the necessary training in. But then there's also the athlete that can show up on race day and can get it done when it counts. And I think those are two totally different sets of psychological skills. And uh, you really kind of need both in order to be able to advance your rowing career. There's a quote that I really like that sounds like kind of what you're talking about. That's not, or it's, um, we don't rise to the level of our expectations. We fall to the level of our training. And that kind of speaks to that, like, not only need to turn it on and perform in competition, but then to also know that you've got this background of strong training that you can apply to it. Yeah, and, I, you know, I definitely think that when you get on the line, when you're sitting on the starting line or you know, you're sitting on the erg and you're getting ready to do a terrible erg test, some of, uh, some of that mind, mindset will come from the experiences that you've had that lead up to that moment. And when you've had positive experiences that you can build on and you gain confidence from, that definitely makes a big difference. So being able to lean on that training mentally. But I, I actually also think there's a totally different skill set that it takes to be able to show up and handle pressure. Um, that, that doesn't necessarily have to do with your training. Uh, you can be an incredible trainer. And I've seen so many athletes that are uh, awesome, like really pretty incredible at showing up day in and day out and never losing their intention or losing that uh, intensity that's needed to, to be really good at training, but just did not have it when it came to race day. Uh, either they would crumble under pressure or they didn't know how to bring all that training into the moment that really mattered. So I think they're two different sets of skills and, and both are important. You can't really get away without having one or the other. Interesting. Well, I'll look forward to getting into that more as uh, the episode goes on here. Um, Joe, you want to go next on mindset and importance? Yeah, uh, for me, what, what comes to mind is being able to uh, handle adversity uh, and bounce back from it, uh, both internally. Um, so wh whatever you might be dealing with, you know, on a day to day or week to week, month to month throughout the year kind of basis, and then also externally. Um, what can be sometimes going on that's um, outside of your control, whether that's a team dynamic situation or, you know, race type situation. Um, so being able to kind of stay level headed and, um, you know, bounce back from those things. That's uh, that's pretty important. But on Blake. Yeah, I'd say I'd keep it pretty simple. I think a lot of it for the sport of rowing specifically, it's just the ability to to really push into discomfort and and find that next wall and just continue to to break down walls and, and move on to the next one. Because I mean, 
it's an extremely challenging sport and it never gets easier. Uh, the faster you go, it, it stays just as strong as hard and uh, may even get harder. And, um, I think it's all about being able to push into discomfort as opposed to backing away from that discomfort. Um, I think a lot of it in terms of, you know, race strategy is being able to stay relaxed when you need to not letting kind of someone's walk or, or someone pushing you to really freak you out, um, and to kind of lose your strategy and to kind of let your technique fly out the window. Um, and also just being able to crank it up when needed and, and really push through with your teammates. Nice. Um, so I'm going to cheat and take somebody else's definition because uh, there's a coach that I really like named James Leith. Uh, he's the head of leadership and character development at um, IMG Academy. Uh, if you don't know IMG, if you're outside of the U.S. or something, uh, it's basically Hogwarts for athletes. Uh, it's a powerhouse sport development program. You pay tuition and go there, and that's your school, and you prepare for your sporting career and stuff through that. Um, anyway, he wrote... A uh, great blog post defining mental toughness. Uh, I'll, I'll link it in the show notes here. But uh, his definition is an athlete uh, who's mentally tough is able to access their talent at the highest level they're capable of on a consistent basis, regardless of the situation. Um, yeah, that's you, a good one. If you can't wrap your head around why that's important in the sport of rowing, then uh, I don't really know what to tell you. But um, what do you guys think of that definition? Because to me, that that kind of hits everything that you guys just talked about in in one swoop. Yeah, to me, that just um, the way that he describes it, that's just saying that it doesn't matter what's going on around you. And, you know, I've heard a lot of rowers <laughs> say things like, oh, I just really hope that X, Y, or Z happens on the day of the race day. And really by hoping that things will line up or that the stars are going to magically, you know, align and the cosmos will come together for you on your race day, that's that's leaving a lot for chance. But when you are able to control what you can control and, and bring your best possible self, um, you know, really through any situation, regardless of what's going on around you. Yeah. I think that that does make for a really well-rounded successful athlete. And I love that point too, because rowing is such a sport of control. Like the other sport that I coach is lacrosse. I coach high school lacrosse and it's utter chaos. <laughs> it's, you, you never really know. We can't really scout other teams that well because it's high school and we're all over the state. Uh, it, it's total chaos. Rowing you know it's going to be 2,000 meters. You know who's going to be in your boat. And then you're rowing your race. And other people don't really have an effect on you uh, as far as your actual race that you're going to row. So uh, I, think, I think it's a great point that like there shouldn't be any questions when you're, when you're there. There shouldn't be anything that you're hoping to happen because it would have yeah. already happened in training. Hope is not a strategy. Uh, you know, you, you have to prepare the best that you possibly can and and then mentally show up on the day and take care of what you can take care of. And I think that would be an interesting topic for us to get into as well. But I, I have found personally as an athlete, and I've seen a lot of other athletes realize this as well, that as soon as you can get over what is in your control and what is out of contr your control, you are able to then take this next step into – into your development as an athlete because you're no longer worrying about things that you literally have no ability to change. Nice. Um, so let's go over to Blake here. Um, the next thing I had is, is we just defined what a strong mindset is. So when you rode, did you have a strong mindset? Um, and if you could go back and do it again, what do you wish you would have improved? Yeah, I would, uh, I would say I probably thought I did. I don't think I did now that I look back on it. Um, like in high school, I, you know, by my junior year and senior year, I was the fastest kid on the team. So I, I thought I had kind of like reached my peak. Uh, then I moved on to college and all of a sudden I was surrounded by a lot of guys that were better than me and a lot of guys that were the same. And it just like completely changed my perspective of, of I guess, my standards and expectations for myself. Um, and it can completely like broke down new walls for me. Um, and I, I wouldn't say I probably ever reached my peak there either. Um, but I think in the moment I thought I, I had a strong mindset. Um, looking back on it, like what I would have changed. I mean, uh, the big thing for me is that I, I got injured in college. So I think the biggest thing I would have changed is to stay involved with the team and, and really focused on what I could have done to, to re return and re rehab. Um, I think a lot of times when people get injured, they, they kind of think that there's no option for them and they, they kind of seclude themselves. Um, and then that, that ends up just 
leading down this negative rabbit hole. So yeah, personally, I would have, I would have stayed involved with the team. I would have done everything I could have, could have done to improve and just avoided things that hurt me at the point at that point And just, uh, seen where that had taken me. Was there, I know we talked about your injury on the injury prevention episode, a, a couple episodes back, but, um, was there any discussion of sports psych in any part of your rehab at all? Uh, no, not at all. Interesting, because I think, I mean, I know we'll get into that with Sarah later on too, but um, I think that's a, a hugely powerful potential application for sports psych there, and that's uh, a, a missed opportunity for sure. Joe, you want to go next on a uh, mindset when you rode? Sure. Um, so when I look back at, um, you know, when I was racing a lot during college, um, both in practice and during racing I had a very strong mindset, uh, in terms of just being very intense. Um, and I really enjoyed, uh, both elements, the process of training, uh, as well as the racing and kind of really pushing, pushing myself physically and mentally. Um, and sometimes, you know, that would lead to good results and other times that would lead to bad results of whether it would be blowing up on a, a piece or uh, a test. Um, but what I've gotten better at as I've gotten older, and this probably is a result of being more mature, is um, looking back and realizing like you need to be not so high, not so low. Like you got to take it in stride. And, and when you have the days that things don't go quite the way that you were expecting or the way that you want, um, now what I do is I, I evaluate a lot more and look at the days leading up to uh, that, you know, that bad training session. Um, and was it something in terms of programming? Was it something in terms of sleep, you know, poor nutrition? Um, what variables are going into that, um, you know, and led to the bad performance? And then from that, you know, making sure that I mitigate or reduce that as much as possible moving forward. Um, so that's what I would go back and change. Yeah, it's interesting now as a as a coach of guys, you know, three to six years younger than me, um, finding that line of like encouraging passion on a day-to-day -day basis because you've got to come to training with some sort of fire and intensity, but also the line of like, hey, this only matters as much as this training session, this block, this sport, this kind of thing. Like you can't totally get wrapped up in it. Um, but I think it's interesting to, to try to find where that line is. A absolutely. I mean, and the, the, the big thing too is, is you know, going back to the, the point I, I said uh, in my initial responses is as long as you're learning and you're walking away and you're taking something that you can apply to, you know, the next race or the next training session, that's still like improvement. And it doesn't necessarily directly show up on the screen um, always, but if you're becoming a more intelligent and mature athlete, that will translate over time into uh, better practices and better performances out on the race course. Love that's, that, really Joe. that's that's something I said about a dozen times in our <laughs> just this last weekend is that it's not a failure as long as you learn something from it. The only time it's a failure is when you don't learn anything because then you're just going to repeat it again. Sorry, yeah. Sarah, I didn't need to cut you off there. No, I just love that. And I know Joe and I have actually talked about this specifically before. And I agree it, that that's the same way that I look at failure. Something's only really a failure if you let it defeat you completely and you don't take it to help yourself grow to the next step. And I would just take it one step further beyond just learning something. Now, now making a change that you can implement either to your own athletic career or to your personal life because yeah, you, you can learn something great and then not do anything about it, right? You can say like, oh, I learned this awesome lesson and then not apply it. Um, but really actually take being accountable for maybe those tough lessons that you've learned and making sure that you they're, they're not going to waste that they mean something because now now you're acting on them that's a good point sarah i was just going to say that's that's spot on um and one of the other the other things i've realized too is that um like you said you're learning and recognizing what what's going wrong and making the change and a lot of times what i see have seen in myself and in others as well is 
it's not necessarily always just a, a something in regards to training. These things can actually be um, behaviors. And it, it, now you're going to kind of get into the realm of changing your behavior, changing your pattern um, in your, you know, your daily habits. And that also is going to fold into the, uh, you know, the improvement and performance as well. Absolutely. So Sarah, what was your mindset like uh, as an athlete at, at various stages of your career? Um, I would say overall pretty strong, um, but that there were a few weaknesses in there that um, I worked to try to improve and you know, a couple of things that I never really completely improved. Um, but in general, I would say like I pride I really prided myself on being able to look, uh, you know, at a starting line across all my other competitors or even against my competition internally on the team and to say to myself that I knew I was the toughest one out of the group and that if nothing else, I was going to be mentally tougher than everyone around me. Um, and that was something that I could absolutely control. I couldn't control if I was shorter or if I weighed less or if I hadn't slept as well the night before, um, or if you know my erg score hadn't been that great up until that point, but I was going to suffer more than the person next to me because I was just going to be tougher. Um, so I think that was something that I always really relied on, and um, I, was, I was proud of that. I think a couple things that I wasn't so great at was very similar to what Joe was just talking about. Um, the ups and downs, for sure, was something that I struggled with, that I would be pretty emotional, um, not necessarily to my teammates, but like not able to leave something at the boathouse, I would come home and we would talk about it for a while after. Um, and it would sit with me sometimes if I was, you know, really upset about a row or something hadn't gone well. Um, but what I ended up learning how to do was not actually, I was never able to get rid of the emotion. And I think that that would have been stifling really my personality and it would have not really let who I was as an athlete come out if I tried to just be so even keeled. And I tried at points to do that and it didn't work well. Um, but instead harnessing that emotion and allowing those maybe lows to just motivate me rather than slow me down. Um, and, and then I did at some point get better at, um, you know, leaving some of those ups and downs at the boathouse and then trying to come home and just like restart and get ready for the next uh, session that I had. So th that was something that I think I did improve on. Another thing that I struggled with for a while was um, dealing with the elements, specifically wind. Wind was a tough one for me. Um, all through college and definitely on the national team as well, uh, re like overanalyzing it, being like, what am I, what, what are the wind conditions going to be this day? How are they going to affect me? Am I good in a tailwind or a headwind or a crosswind or whatever it is? And then what's going to happen if it switches? Um, and the way that we handled that was just by practicing in absolutely everything. The more that we got comfortable with it, the more we realized, oh, hey, it's not really that big of a deal. Or, the, you know, I can get through a 25, a 20 mile per hour wind situation in training, um, that it's, it's not the worst thing in the world. You can still do it. And we just developed our skill there. That was something that mentally was tough for me, but that we were actually able to overcome. So did you row it out of the trials this year? <laughs> yes, I did. Um, <laughs> but I wrote on Saturday, so it wasn't as bad as everybody else had it for Sunday. Um, but, uh, but yeah, yeah. So yeah, we, we flew our sure guys all the way out there and got just <laughs> blown out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, that sounds like good old exposure therapy then for the most part, right? Yeah, for that one, for sure. Um, I think ex exposure helped because there were... I mean, I, I went to school at Princeton um, University and we rode on Lake Carnegie and then the national team did a lot of their training there as well. So that lake is literally perfect almost all the time. And when you get used to that being your main condition and that's where you're having all of your best rows in, when all of a sudden you travel somewhere and the conditions are crap, you you know, it's, it's definitely a little bit disturbing um, and that would kind of mess with me. So... We actually specifically would go to places to train uh, where the weather was bad and we would not uh, just stay on, the, on land um, during some of those sessions. Obviously, you know, there were situations where we, we couldn't do that, but um, not letting it always deter us, not letting a 10 mile per hour, 15 mile per hour say, oh, you know what, today's just going to be a wash. It's not going to be as good. Um, so just change the subject a little bit because I love listening to your rowing chat and hearing about your multi-sport upbringing that that rowing wasn't your only sport until you got to college right right that sorry yes right that's correct so um yeah. i in high school i played soccer and i swam and um my rowing team actually was 
a uh, fall and spring sport team, but my coach let me um, only row in the spring. He was really great about that. He understood that soccer was still really important to me. And uh, I think he recognized the well-roundedness that it brought to my athleticism. So um, I didn't go full-time until I got to college. Because I'm, I'm, I'm a huge uh, anti-specialization guy. Um, and so I loved hearing that on rowing chat. But what I wanted to ask too, was there one or any of your coaches – uh, who kind of instilled that uh, toughness, grinded out kind of mindset with you? It was more my dad um, than any coaches. I actually have this um, very specific memory of when I was pretty young, finishing an indoor soccer game, and um, <laughs> my dad asked me how he thought I, how did I think I had played during that game? And basically, I just hadn't given enough effort. I, you know, he had caught me a couple of times, like looking at a piece of fluff floating around in the air and like not actually being aggressive or paying attention to the game. And having um, somebody like my dad bring that to my attention and making me realize that me not giving something my full effort was, you know, obviously not the way we wanted to go about this. Uh, that just made me realize how much was in within my control as far as my effort and my mindset went. Like I, I could be more aggressive and I could be tougher and I could be more focused than the people next to me. And then, yes, I, I also think by the time I got to college, my coach, Lori Dauphiny, really did teach our group the skill of how to get through those tough moments. Um, and, and that helped it to develop as well. Very cool. Um, and then I get to answer my own question here. I was, I very much did not have a strong mindset when I rode. Um, I kind of did the typical teen guy thing. It would just kind of hate my way through sessions. Um, and it, that, that burned me out pretty hard. Uh, I, did, I also did the typical, you know, uh, let me add sessions on my own and ended up doing too much lifting without regard for how much it would affect my, uh, rowing training. Um, and then I would just try to get angry and smash my way through workouts. Uh, I had a lot of stress around 2Ks and erging in general, um, undeservedly, because my times were very mediocre. Uh, and the mental pressure that I put on myself uh, definitely led me to quit the sport before I should have. So fortunately, I've got a chance, uh, a second chance now, I guess, with um, competing in strongman and powerlifting to kind of take a different mindset. But I wonder, because Joe, you brought it up too, um, with the difference that maturity makes. And there definitely is, uh, you know, the difference of being a decade older than, than when I rode. Um, but I wonder too, like, what if somebody had presented you with the skills that you have now, mental skills wise, would you have been open to them then? Do you think they would have made a difference? What do you think? Um, I don't think I would have had the, the maturity uh, to, to be open to them. Uh, I definitely look back, you know, even five, six years ago in my uh, mid twenties. Oh man, I'm getting old, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and and thinking, you know, like what the hell do they know? Like I know more than that person, you know, type of thing, and like writing somebody off, and they're legitimately trying to give you good advice. Um, and some of that, I think, is you know, you're, you're younger, you, you think you know more than you really do. Um, you know, and, and there's a double edged sword of that. Um, sometimes being naive and a novice, uh, you don't set limitations and barriers, which is really good. Um, so you don't have a concept of like what's good or what's bad. You just kind of like, you know, work hard and have tunnel vision, which is a plus. And then on the downside is you, don't listen to other people um, and, and aren't, you know, open to, to advice. So um, looking back, I think it would have been very difficult. And that, that wasn't because I wasn't coachable. It was more, um, you know, I, I put up kind of a wall and like, I always try to like internalize a lot of what um, happened results wise, whether it was out of my control or not. Because I think that that is an interesting hurdle to the whole mental skills discussion. It's one that we talk a lot about in in my uh, Psych of Athletes class. Is like audience members, everybody listening to this right now, we love you. But the only people who are going to listen to a, a podcast that the title is Psychology or Performance are the people who are already open minded to that. So kind of thinking about like how do we reach those people, uh, whether they're our athletes or anybody else who. Uh, we want to try to help them develop a better mindset, but there's some sort of barrier blocking them from doing so. 
it, uh, it comes back to what we were talking about before and, and you know, Sarah hit on this point, um, you know, initially is it's, you know, recognizing that. And if you want to get better, you have to make a change. Right. And this is like what I was kind of talking about in terms of behavior. Like a lot of this stuff is like recognizing, you know, what, what are your weaknesses and addressing those. It's really easy to, you know, work on the things that you're good at because you can go in and, you know, feel like very confident, but working on the stuff that you're not so good at, uh, is not fun because it takes more time. It takes more focus, more effort. Um, and it's humbling and it's frustrating. Um, but those are the, the things that if you address them in the long run are going to take you much further. Interesting. Um, and, and so that actually segues into the next thing, which is, uh, what are some red, red flags for when you recognize that, that a rower or client does not have a strong, uh, mindset and, and how does that hold them back? Cause we had an interesting situation just a few weeks ago. This is an eight week ERG program. And at the end of week four, we had a, uh, basically a checkup 2k test that should have put them and then they knew about this ahead of time. It wasn't a surprise 2k. I hate those. We can get into that later. Um, but it was supposed to put them out 10 seconds above their goal split for the program. And it was amazing because these guys were pulling intervals at their 2K split or at, the, at their goal split and had been training around it and training had been going great. And then we put them in this 2K test mindset. And even though it was supposed to be slower than what their training was, a lot of them started to have barriers and blocks and, and choked and all sorts of stuff. So I, I think that a red flag for me and a common pitfall is the thought that you don't need to develop mental skills until you have a problem. So a lot of the guys who I talked to that day had this attitude of like, oh, I don't know, that had never happened before. Like I had never choked before, so why would I choke now? But the reality is that, and Joe, you mentioned this too, like everybody's going to choke at some point. Everybody's going to blow a 2K test at some point. Um, so everybody should start developing mental skills before that becomes a problem. Uh, and then even if you don't ever choke on a 2K test for some reason, beyond that, you know, life is going to be a lot harder than a 2K test. So these uh, mental skills are, are helpful beyond that. Sarah, do you have any red flags that you watch out for with, with anybody you work with? Well, I would just say that um, well, one of the biggest red flags is just some an excuse maker, right? So somebody that always has a reason why something didn't work out um, or why today isn't going to be the day. Um, and you see that happen a good amount, you know, around test time or around those moments where a score actually matters. Um, and I think the difference between somebody like that who, who you know, is showing a red flag and, and the other side of it, like an athlete that you – that you want on your team, um, those are the people that are dying for the opportunity to showcase what they have and are just waiting for for the chance to test themselves um, versus this person that's you know really trying to avoid it. And um, so that would be my my biggest red flag that I see. Um, and then the other one is just the, the same sort of thing that I touched on before: is somebody that's really great at training but doesn't know how to show up on the day uh, because. Because if you're if you're not going to be able to get there for race day, then you know that's that's really the point of the sport, right? Is so that you can you can race and you can perform as as well as you possibly can on those days. So those would be my two biggest red flags that I see. Great stuff, Joe. Yeah, I'll jump in. Um, the two that come to mind for me, one is the first one is pacing. Um, so it's it's absolutely critical that you you know how to go hard. But at the same time, it's equally important that you know how to manage your energy expenditure and you're not, you know, flying and dying and just crashing at the beginning of, you know, whether it's a test piece or out on the race course. Um, and, you know, some of that's going to come with, with maturity um, and experience and just in getting the meters in over time. Um, but I think that's a, that's, a, that's a big one. And then the second one um, – is you know the the days uh or the pieces or the races that you have where you know you may have done everything right leading up to that like you got the right amount of rest and nutrition's good and you know you, you feel good and you get into the race and your body's not responding the way that you want it to or you thought it would and learning how to really grind and work through those types of pieces is invaluable 
um, because you need to be able to teach your your body that I can I can get this to respond the way I want it to under pressure in a race type situation, even when I don't feel my best, uh, even when you know I'm down a couple seats and things are not going the way that that I anticipated. Uh, say especially when. Yeah, exactly. Because that's that's the thing. You you have to you have to know how to do that. And there's no like you know course or class or you know video that we can like watch. That is just pure experience. And that really we we doubt a lot of people. Um, you know, working through those you know times in the trenches, um, and and that will teach you a lot. Um, and, and it goes back to the whole point. It's, it's okay. As long as you're, you're learning from it, identifying it, and then implementing a change, changing your behavior, you're, you're going to come out much better in the long term. And so just to go back to the first thing you said, do you think that the pacing and an inability, an inability to pace is a function of the athlete's mental skill set? Uh, I, I on some level I do because I think it's a, it's a maturity and a, a developmental thing. Right. So like if we were working with a group of like novices, like obviously their ability to, to pace is not going to be, uh, as strong. They just, they just don't have any concept of it. You know, you're, you're trying to teach them to, to go hard and race hard at the beginning. And then, you know, as they're working their way, you know, think of a freshman going through, through their uh, first year, you know, as they're working their way through that, that first year, they're getting more meters under their belt. They're doing more pieces. They, they learn that, okay, I need to, you know, kind of measure myself like, yeah, I'm going to go hard, but I need to spread it out, spread the load out over the entire piece versus I'm just going to front load it and just try to hang on for dear life. Um, so that's, you know, that's the piece that's not necessarily in the, in the programming on the piece of paper that you see on the chalkboard or, or um, up on the whiteboard that day. And that's, that can be a huge, uh, you know, step towards, towards getting the athletes to develop well. Got it. Blake, anything you want to add here? Yeah. Uh, from my experience as a coach, I feel like the athletes that have negative self-talk um, and whether they, they're saying it out loud or, or whether it's just how they show with their body language. Um, I think, I think that's the biggest red flag. Um, so it's the kid that kind of like walks around with his head down and always shaking his head and goes into a test in a race, just thinking the worst of, of himself and his potential. Um, that's a huge red flag, but I also feel like we can have the biggest impact on, on kids like that. And in, in terms of not only athletic ability, but also, just changing their mindset throughout life. Cool. So, I mean, this goes right into our next topic, but uh, what would be like an example of how you'd start to approach a negative self-talk issue with one of your athletes? Um, I usually, I try to do things in private um, and just talk to them about how it's, how it's not necessarily helping them. And, um, introduce them to the concept of like a growth mindset versus a fixed mindset. Um, I'm not sure if you guys have read mindset by Carol, or Carol Dweck. Um, yeah. but I, I feel like all of you would love it if you haven't. Um, but growth, growth mindsets, basically, you know, you're, you're willing to accept the fact that you are what you are today and that everything you do is to work on improvement, uh, versus a fixed mindset where, you know, you feel like you're just kind of born with the ability you have and you have no ability to improve from there. This is the concept um, around grit, right? So that's, the, that's um, what I've heard this talking, talked about before is that, um, that but when you look at the foundation around grit, the concept of grit, that what, what you're saying right here about around fixed versus growth, um, that, that's a big part of that, what builds into that. Yeah, I actually don't know exactly what you're referring to, but like her – her big theme was she just divided the two mindsets in half and she found that, you know, people that grew up with a growth mindset or, or learned a growth mindset tended to be better at basically anything in life and, and school and, and school, um, and athletics, um, and then in work. Um, 
versus people who had a mixed mindset or sorry, a fixed mindset where they're just, they're kind of scared of failure. I think, uh, another book recommendation, one, one that I've just finished is called run to the roar. Um, and it's by the squash coach from Trinity college who had some just hundreds and hundreds of games winning streak who's the winningest coach in NCAA history squash. I don't know. I know that's big up there in the Northeast, but, um, not exactly on the national radar for coaching wins. And the basic idea of run to the roar, Sarah, you talked about this too, with like, uh, finding walls and then breaking them down. Run to the roar is the idea that, uh, when lions hunt, they've got the the like oldest lion goes on one side of the gazelle, and then all the other lions go over on the other sides of the gazelle. And then the old lion, who can't really do anything as far as chasing or whatever, lets out this big old roar, and it scares the gazelle, and they run into the waiting jaws of the younger fit lions, who then slaughter them up. Uh, run to the roar says that, well, if the gazelle had just run toward the roar, they would have found out that what they fear is just a toothless old lame lion. Um, and so it's kind of the same, the same, you know, fear of failure kind of mindset um, is, is in getting athletes to, to try to seek out that point and then break through it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so the next, the, the next topic in general is just men mental skills and how to incorporate them in training. So uh, we can pretty much just go through this. This should be the most, uh, practical part as far as name of mental skill, explanation of what it is, um, and how you can incorporate it into training. Uh, so we can pretty much just go one, one by one and just start and see where we end up. But a good a, a good bu bu building point would be if there was a red flag that you saw, what would be the first mental skill that you would use to address it? Um, so Joe, why don't you go first with that? Sure. So uh, the, probably the first thing that I would do um, is if an athlete is, is having an, uh, trouble, um, you know, sitting down and discussing with them, you know, what, what's the sticking point? Um, is it something that they, they don't feel confident in the training, like they're well prepared? Or is it something more on, you know, the mental side that it's sort of, uh, you know, like a mental snowball that builds up as they're going through the the piece uh, or the race, that you know they just start to lose confidence, and you know things get worse and worse, and before you know it, you know they're they're out of control. So I think that's you got to identify where they're having an issue, um, and then you know taking some steps to address that. Uh, so if it's one, for example, if it's something where they don't feel like they're well prepared, that might be a situation where you know talking to them, okay, wh what do you want to do or what do you think you would benefit from in training so that you, the next time you sit down on the ERG, you feel um, confident in your ability to go after that split. So that would be, you know, my recommendation for, for that type of situation. Cool. Sarah, how about you? Um, I would say, so what uh, we've been talking about a little bit here is, you know, just the ability to um, make sure that you're confident enough that you're able to push through these moments. And so uh, I believe that that's partly a, a coach's job to tee up those moments for you to build confidence in. Um, and, you know, obviously there's going to be those situations where we're trying to have the athletes grow, you know, through a really hard situation, but we have to also give their, give them opportunities to succeed and not always having them be so difficult that, you know, failure Failure is right around the corner. Um, and, and once we build up these situations where there have been, you know, some wins under your belt and not even necessarily having to be in the boat, but, you know, just tests that push you mentally and that you were able to conquer, then teaching your athletes to rely on those moments when um, you have another hard moment that pops up. And that's something that worked really well for me is that when I would sit on the starting line or I would be sitting on the erg, I would quickly think about a moment where I had been very successful and those feelings that I had right before I started um, that those races or those erg tests and then try to draw on them again. Um, and being able to draw on previous experiences I think are really important. So teaching your athletes how to do that, um, but then also giving them the opportunities to, to have those, those moments to, to recall. 
Cool. And, and so does that get into like visualization at all? Like, are, are you actually imagining uh, going back to one of those moments or, or what, what practical skill set is that like? So I actually worked with directly with a sports psychologist um, in the last couple of years of my training. And one of the techniques that he had my partner and I work on was completely dissecting whatever we considered to be our most successful um, race experience ever. So for me, that would be my Olympic um, heats race. I think that was probably my best performance as an athlete. And so we really looked at that situation and tried to remember everything about it. So what, how did I feel the few days leading into it? How did I feel when I was actually sitting there, um, like emotionally, what were the things that I was feeling? And so for me specifically, a lot of that had to do with gratitude for the moment. Um, like just being really happy and thankful that I was actually there. Uh, this recognition of the support and the love that I was feeling like from my partner and from my coaches and from my family. And then also just the feeling of absolutely no fear. Like there was nothing to lose all I, all then only everything to gain. And so really trying to use those three emotions to tap into those again, when I had something hard that was going on. So do, do, am I feeling like there's something to fear here? And if I was starting to feel some sense of fear, like really focusing on letting go of that, um, and then gratefulness would help help me a lot as well. Be, even though I have to test right now or I have to do a 6K or 2K test and it's not the thing that I would choose to do at this moment, I am grateful that I'm healthy, that um, my training is going well enough that I can be here and, and test myself and use it as a, a moment just to check in where my training is. And, uh, you know, I'm happy that this is something I get to do every day. And, and those uh, kind of going through those things would be really, really helpful with putting my mind at ease and then getting me into the right mindset to have a good performance. Cool. So it sounds almost like somewhere between uh, like a, a mantra almost. Did you ever have a formal mantra that you used? No, it was, there was never something that I would like say to myself over and over it was more just that you know those those feelings drawing those emotions more than anything else because i think that that the ma mantra is something that i that i like a lot um and that and that i would like to see more athletes using is because rowing is, or rowing and particularly erging is so repetitive that when you do start to get that self-doubt and that and that fear and that other stuff coming in on you then just having three words that you can focus on um, in times of stress can often be helpful for that. Uh, but it sounds like, so for you is almost more, uh, cognitive reframing that more that direction. Yeah. And, and really just kind of putting myself back into that moment as much as possible. So a combination of visualization and, and yeah, and the emotional, uh, drawing. Cool. Um, cognitive reframing, uh, the basic idea is, that events just depend on how you interpret them. So uh, the cognitive reframing has what's called the ABC model, and A in that is the activating event, and then B is the belief, and then C is the consequences. And that could be emotional or behavioral. So the activating event could be, uh, you know, okay, it's a, it's a 2K test and that I really don't want to do. And the belief is, oh, I hate this. You can kind of go down that negative spiral and then the emotional and the behavioral consequence are usually then feeling bad about it and possibly doing worse on the test than if you came in with a different mindset. So uh, you can change this really. The activating event is kind of always going to be the same, uh, but you can change this at the beliefs stage um, by reframing the negative into either a positive or into a challenge. And often when I explain this at first, people are like, oh, so you just lie to yourself. Like, well, not exactly, because you're just lying to yourself in a different way when you believe something negative, right? And I know, Sarah, this is something you've talked about with like, you have the event, either you can control it or you can't. So what is your belief about this event going to be? And if you're out here anyway, it might as well be something moving you forward. Right. Yeah. And so I, I've seen two things a lot of times pop up either on erg tests or on race day is that one, people put so much pressure on what the result is actually going to be. When I think if you can change the context of the way you're looking at it, um, for erg tests, especially, I think the best way to look at an erg test is just, it is a 
it is a marker of where you are at this moment. And that is it. Um, as to whether your training is working, as to whether, you know, all of the other stimulus that have come up before this moment, whether it's sleep, nutrition, whether those have all lined up, it is simply a marker of where you are right now and nothing more. And if you can give yourself the context of that around either a big race or an erg test, I think that helps a lot. But then the other one just being that, yes, you can only control so much and um, a lot of people can like really fear the pain that is going to be there regardless. Pain is going to happen in a 2K race. It's and it it hurts whether or not you're performing at your best or, or you're having the greatest race of your life. It still hurts. So as soon as you can recognize that being in pain is one of those things that's out of my control, and I'm just going to accept that part of it and really kind of embrace it more than anything else. That that's been another thing that I've seen that really helps a lot as far as mindset goes. Just recognizing that I, the way that I react to the pain is completely within my control. The pain itself really isn't. And you can kind of see that on an athlete's face too when they're sitting there on the erg and you can tell that they're just waiting until the pain, right? They're just counting down until that hits. If you can get in and kind of flip that around, so instead of waiting for it to happen, you're hunting for it, right? And you just change your mindset to be, all right, when the pain hits, that's good. That means I'm here. That means here's what I'm doing. Um, then that's another point where you can cognitively reframe that as uh, instead of a negative event, just a challenge. Just, hey, here we go. You know, this is it. Yeah, absolutely. Blake, Joe, any, any skills you want to talk about in particular? Um, I wouldn't say like specific individual skills, but I feel like from a, from a coaching perspective, just kind of providing an environment where you just, you foster, you know, the growth mindset, you foster mistakes and, and learning and making progress. Just, just like you guys have talked about thus far. Um, and Sarah, I really liked when you talked about opportunities to succeed. Um, cause I feel like a lot of coaches think the, the only way to improve their athlete is just to run them into the ground day after day after day. Um, and if you, you never actually give them a chance to succeed and, and really achieve a goal, they're never actually going to learn um, or gain confidence. And I feel like a lot of the times you have to, you have to experience something to earn the right to be confident in the first place. Yeah, I would agree with that too, Blake. And I think that actually goes hand in hand with what um, Joe was saying before about pacing. Uh, I've done, you know, two different approaches to, to really hard pieces. For a little while, I had a coach who really liked the idea of um, going until failure. So I want you to hold this split for as long as you possibly can. And when you no longer can, you're done. And sometimes I think that's appropriate, but I think that that can lead down a really tough rabbit hole of one, you're getting really good at failing, right? You keep, you keep, you know, blowing up at a piece and you're getting more and more used to stopping when the pain hits. And I think that that, that is a very slippery slope. So if you are a coach that is very dialed into those pacing numbers that you're giving to an athlete and you're giving them the proper ones to match this workout that you're prescribing, now you're setting them up for an opportunity to succeed within, you know, the framework that makes sense. Um, and, and that's where a lot of confidence can come from. Uh, one, one strategy or piece of advice I, I would, uh, give, and this is something I, uh, did a lot of when I would do great race pieces. Um, so, you know, identify what your target split is going into that piece and then mentally break up, you know, whether it's for distance or time, break it up into, uh, manageable bite-sized chunks mentally. Um, if you look at it, whether it's like a full 2K or 6K, you know, whatever the piece is, if you look at it in its entirety, it can be very overwhelming off the bat. But if you can sort of break it up into, um, you know, say 6,000 6, meters, for example, if you're breaking it up into 1,000 meter chunks and you're, you're pacing yourself, so every time you hit that, you know, that 1K mark, it's like, boom, I'm putting a little bit of money in the bank. like check that box. All right. I'm good. And you know, it's, I always try to look at it like I'm, I'm building confidence throughout the piece, even though I'm getting tired and it's hurting more and more. Um, and I think that's important to do 
um, because if you have the, the mental confidence, it's going to carry over physically. Nice. Um, I've got an article series on my website that's uh, mental skills for rowing, and it's a three-part article series that covers, uh, I think, seven or eight different mental skills that people could take and immediately put into training. So we'll get that link in the show notes too, but there are just some that I think are highly beneficial. So I'll, I'll probably just rattle off some of these and then hit each of you up for whether or not you've used it, if you have any tips, or if you don't think it's useful, and then we can argue about that, and that'll be fun. Um, so one is developing pre practice and pre performance routines. So like I've got a pre practice routine for my guys practice, <laughs> like for my team's practice, I've got a, I've got a routine that I need to do in order to get out the door in a consistent mindset by five Oh five in the morning so that I can get to the boathouse at five twenty, so that I can open things up and be ready for people to get there at five thirty. So the night before I get my clothes laid out, I get my little go cup set up. I put the right amount of water in the kettle. I put my keys on the, you know, cause otherwise I'm running around trying to find my wallet, trying to find my keys. Uh, and then I, you know, I go out and I find out that the car needs to be scraped of ice and then that throws everything off. And then next thing you know, it's five 30 and I'm not ready to coach. So pre-practice routines are those things that you guys have used at all. We'll just yeah. go, we'll, we'll go in order for this. We'll do Sarah, Joe, Blake for, for all of these. Yes. hundred percent. Yep both for racing and for practice. Joe, you're up. Um, sorry. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, and I, the only other thing I would add is that uh, it's constantly evolving, right? Um, so I, I try to pay attention to, um, especially after the session while it's like fresh in my mind, like I kind of run down like, okay, was that effective? Did that help me? you know, did I feel really good mentally in terms of being warmed up and ready to go and, um, ready to like attack and get into the work for the training session? Um, or were there some things that, you know, I, I looking back, I left unaddressed that, you know, I need to make sure I account for. Um, so the, what I would do is make sure you either jot that down or just making a mental note is not enough because you're not going to remember. So taking some sort of note, whether it's electronic or on paper, uh, is, is helpful. Yeah, you've got 2K brain. You're not going to remember anything. Uh, Blake, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah, I'm all about routine, especially for my team. I, I, think, I think to try something that's unknown and new the day of uh, race day is a really bad idea, and I feel like it kind of helps them relax um, going into race day, even though they may be stressed out. Yeah, and, and that's the big thing is that it's just putting you in a consistent state. What, regardless of which way that is, it's at least consistent. So you can at least track that and then make small changes to it rather than, I mean, if you think about it, for anybody who's routine skeptic, if you think about it the other way, imagine that you had to find your clothes in different locations every morning when you got up. Imagine if you got in your car and took a different route to the boathouse every morning when you got there. Imagine if you left a different, you know, one morning it's 5.04, the next morning it's 5.13. You know, like, I mean, if you, if you think of life without routines, you can think of how stressed out that would be. So developing routines to put yourself in that low stress and consistent state of mind, I think is, is a really big one. Um, I also really like mental reset routines. Uh, and I use this mostly with my high school lacrosse team where after they make a mistake in order to break that negative self-talk cycle, I will actually have them like either it, it kind of changes year by year based on what they like to do, but I'll have them like shake their arms out or brush their shoulders off or wipe the front of their jersey as like uh, we're wiping away the mistake. How about that? Sarah, something you've used or no? I have not used that specific of a uh, tactic where it's actually physical, um, but it's been more of like just these quick mental resets where I can see a negative self-talk coming in and it's just a quick like, nope, stop, like stop this before it continues, clear your head, focus on the task at hand and go. Um, and, that, and that's been really helpful for me, just kind of taking it one step at a time and making sure that you stop any sort of a negative self-talk before it grows into something bigger. I think if your mindset's strong enough, then yeah, you could definitely get away with doing it without the physical side. The physical is just a really easy, like, let's physically break this off right now. Yeah, I like that. Joe, Blake. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, in terms of, you know, doing anything physically, um, I have not. Um, but, you know, similar to, to Sarah, you know, the the second that you uh, have that kind of that, that voice entering your mind, um, you know, trying to uh, calm it down or, or get rid of it. Um, and there's this really good uh, Zen Buddhist quote that I refer back to a lot, but it, Suzuki says the, uh, the biggest waves that we make are the ones that are in our mind. Um, so if you, if you let that thought be something that you deliberate on and think about, you know, whether it's during the piece or leading up to going into a practice or a race, then all of a sudden it manifests itself and it becomes reality. So learning how to recognize it, um, you know, that it's there and then, you know, push it to the side and move on is a very important skill. Before it becomes a negative self-talk tsunami. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Similar to what Joe and Sarah just said, I think the biggest part is just being aware of, of what you're thinking and whether or not it's negative and, and then taking steps from there. I think a lot of people don't even, aren't even aware that they have negative self-thought. Um, so just the awareness will, will go quite a bit. Yeah, for sure. Um, within, I know, so visualization is something that gets talked about a lot, but I think that often it either has one kind of set definition or it's left so abstract that people don't actually know where to start. It's really intimidating to think that, okay, visualization means that I've got to go in a dark room, lie down and mentally go over every meter of a 2K test when that's one good side of visualization, but there are other things that you could do too. So um, relaxation imagery, relaxation visualization is one. Uh, we've been talking about this a lot in my class lately and the benefit of being able to totally relax is that then you can basically partially relax at other times. So it's not realistic to think that you're going to be, I mean, it's not optimal either to be in a totally relaxed state of mind uh, at the starting course of a 2K. But if you're over aroused, and that's something we can talk about too, is the inverse U curve of um, arousal that basically says that there's a a point where you're too high and then there's a point where you're too low and then somewhere in the middle is your own personal optimal point of arousal. Um, so if you find that you're too high, then you could use some of these relaxation techniques to bring it down a little bit. Um, or if you're too low, then you could use some of these energization, visualization or other routines or other uh, kind of methods to bring yourself up into wherever the optimal state is. So Sarah, you're on the line of a 2K test and you're too anxious. What do you do? Uh, focusing on my breathing really has made a big difference. Um, like, we, and I had breath technique as a part of my training when I was full time, um, and so using using that focus on my breath to to you know kind of center myself a little bit to get really present in the moment and to just kind of focus on the task at hand rather than all of the external stimulus that can sometimes make you anxious. That made a big difference for me. Joe, I know you want to talk about breathing, so go ahead. <laughs> uh, no, it, breathing, breathing is a, uh, a big one. Um, I, I know I've mentioned that a ton in previous rowing chats we've done. Um, but that, you know, that helps to calm down the nervous system. Um, but you know, to your point, it depends on the situation. Um, so if you're too, if you're too anxious, you need to do something that's real going to relax you. Um, so the other thing you can do is, you know, shaking your muscles out. You'll see swimmers uh, do that or guys sometimes in the boat, athletes in the boat, they're, they'll grab their, their thighs and they'll, they'll, they'll shake them back and forth. Um, you're, you're getting the tension, you know, out of the muscles. Uh, so that, you, but that's almost a mental reset routine. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I do that in between lifts. So you're learning to, <clears throat> you're learning to contract and tense up your body as, as a singular unit. Um, you know, for example, like thinking of the um, a ke kettlebell military press, you, you got to completely tense your entire body and wedge yourself underneath of that weight. And then after you've utilized all that tension and press the weight to lock out overhead, you set the bell back down on the floor, you bring your heart rate back down, you bring your breathing back down, and then you start to shake out all that tension out of the muscles. Cause we don't, you're, you, you're developing the skill of turning it on and off, relaxation, contraction, tension, relaxation, recovery, drive, right? So 
that's a that's a skill in and of itself that's super important. You don't want to be tense all the time. You want to be tense when you need to be. When it's functional to be, yeah. yeah. Blake, how about you? Do you do any relaxation? Because the other thing you do is think about, you know, your calm setting, your calm state of mind, your calm scene, wherever that is. Do you do you, do you have a, a beach island somewhere that you like to go to mentally? <laughs> Love is in Mexico, but no, I don't use that. Um, <laughs> No, I mean, big thing for me too is breathing. Just, just taking big breaths in through the nose, big long exhale, really getting that heart rate to calm down a bit. I think it's, I think it's pretty rare that people are, are don't have high enough arousal at the starting line. Uh, but most of the time, yeah, people are a little too stressed and they're already working harder. Their heart rate's already higher, higher than it needs to be, just because they're stressed out. Um, in my own training, getting up from a lower arousal state is definitely something that I've had to do for strongman because it's extremely high output for either a one rep max event or for sixty seconds max. Um, then, so I'll 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 post here. I'll I'll put myself out here. Um, we had to do a creative video for an energization routine um, for my Denver class, um, and I'll post mine. And I will say upfront, it is stupid. Right, <laughs> like a, a lot of these mental skills stuff feels really silly when you're doing it for the first time or the second time or whatever. Even still, so like mine is like an energization routine that surrounds visualization as a train, right? So I am a train barreling down the tracks, blowing stuff up in my way. Like one, my YouTube search history from making that movie is now just a hundred percent trains. Um, so it makes me look like I'm five years <laughs> old. Just discovered the internet. <laughs> Um, and the other thing is, I mean, like that's, that's fundamentally like a silly thing to do, but that's what I need to be able to do in order to be in the best setting for my sport. So if that's my goal, then my behavior needs to be whatever it is to match that goal. So yeah, it's silly, but if that lets you accomplish your goal, then why would you let that stop you? So I'll, 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 I'll post that here just to, just to put my money where my mouth is in the show notes. Um, um one, yeah, one thing I wanted to add, uh, just coming back to the um, some of the mental, mental approaches, um, that kind of jog my memory as everybody went around the horn. Uh, I did an interview with, with Mark Allen, uh, this fall, uh, six time Ironman world champion. And one of the things that we talked about was, was learning to, to quiet your mind. And in his last victory, he got off the bike and was entering the, uh, marathon portion of the, the triathlon. And he was down, I think, somewhere around, you know, 13 to 15 minutes uh, at 37 years old. And the guy leading the race was several years younger than him. And, you know, all those voices are, are, are creeping into your mind. Like, you know, I should have, you know, stopped at five. Like, I'm too old, you know. He ends up coming back and winning that race. And, and he said, you know, taking, taking a deep breath, starting with your breath and, getting all of those voices to quiet down all this external noise around you and just focusing on the movement that you're doing and, and getting rid of all those distractions. So something that you can apply to the, to the rowing stroke or um, on the erg or in the boat, learning to quiet your mind and blocking out all those types of external noise is, is going to be very important. I think the, the super interesting thing about that too is is another quote that I like that's luck is what happens when opportunity meets preparation, right? That's probably one you've seen scrawled on a whiteboard somewhere. It's pretty popular, but um, someone will look at a comeback like that and go, wow, wasn't he lucky? But you don't see all of the training and the mental prep and the competition experience, Sarah, like you've been talking about that's gone into that one lucky moment where he comes back from 15 minute deficit. Um, so I think that that's like speaks to the benefit of training with this mindset, uh, success, growth, whatever you want to call it, mentality, um, that like you're going to go out there and, and you're going to be the toughest and, and what a habit that is instead of just something that you try to turn on when you need it. Um, any other comments or specific skills you want to talk about before we move on to the next topic? I just want to add briefly, um, I know there's a, this is another interesting topic. We don't have to get deep into this, but the idea of flow state of how to reach that, that flow. Um, I don't know how much you guys have uh, read about that in general, but um, it, mostly the idea behind that is just that flow state is that really relaxed 
kind of state where you're able to perform at your absolute best um, because you're completely dialed in, but there's not too much stimulus. And the way that I describe that, I've had a few races where I'm positive I hit that perfect flow state because it felt like a fuzzied focus where it's like, yes, you are aware of everything that's going on uh, in that moment. And you are aware that your blade is going in the water and you are pressing, you know, your body weight against it the way that it's supposed to, but it's just fuzzy enough that you can't pick up on all of the details. You're just getting the big picture, almost as if you're like looking down on yourself doing the action that's happening. Um, and and I've, I've found that just by using these kinds of techniques that we've talked about to get yourself into that state that's where that's where the optimal goal is. Cool. Yeah, Joe. I know you wanted to mention something too about uh, visualization and deliberate practice. It sounds like those two are going to work nicely together. Sure. No, I, I think that was a great tie-in by Sarah regarding flow state. Um, and I'll uh, I'll send over a link for the show notes um, for the uh, there's an article uh, I read recently that talks about the original author that came out discussing that that concept in the 1970s. So that'd be something that the listenership might be interested in. Um, but in regards to, you know, visualization and, and deliberate practice, you know, backing up, there's three types of practice. You know, you, so you have practice, purposeful practice, and deliberate practice. And practice is simply, you know, you're, you're showing up and you're doing some sort, sort of uh, activity or sport um, you know, or, uh, weightlifting training session, um, purposeful practices, you have a, a program in mind with a goal in mind and deliberate practice is the next level where you have a coach in place with that program and that coach has proven experience and you're getting feedback and working on your weaknesses and addressing those things. So everything's being fine tuned. So there's a real, um, you know, onus on making sure that all of those those things um, are part of the foundation, and you're going into each training session with a specific focus that's going to lead to that uh, big primary goal that you're working towards. Cool, and I think I mean this is still the strength coach roundtable, so I think that that is a good reminder that like the more times that you can deliberately and purposely practice the skills that we're talking about, the more effective they're going to be later on. So just like Blake said, don't try anything new, you know, the day of the race that you haven't already done in training, you're not going to be able to calm yourself down from an anxious state when you're sitting on the start line, if you haven't already practiced that in your training. So when you're in the weight room, if you've got a set of five squats that you're about to do, practice one of those energization routines you could do it in less than 30 seconds you could do it in between sets and imagine you know the, that those five squats are the first five strokes of your start sequence and you can start to put yourself in this mindset more often that training more deliberately uh and then it's going to be much more easy to to access those skills when you actually need them um you know when when stress is high and things aren't going well well that's a great point and that's one of the reasons why I like strength training so much is it's just it's just another opportunity to practice things in a different environment and it's usually more of an individual level as opposed to trying to coach you know two three boats of kids on the water at once like you can you can get up up close and personal you can put your hands on them you can you can have a work on breathing um, just really another opportunity to work on skills that you've been trying to teach in a different setting and then we'll tie back into Sarah's too that that's an opportunity for a coach or for a strength coach to create those successful opportunities or those opportunities to be successful. So then when that athlete's sitting on the two can line, they go, okay, I know I could do this because here's what I've done before. And they've got success in the diverse range of um, skills and activities that they've done. Yeah, I would agree with that. And I also think that the, one of the greatest parts about bringing your athletes into the weight room, like we're talking about here, is that there is oftentimes a less of an expectation from the athlete because there's less, sometimes less experience there. And so like, well, a lot of things that we would do, we would do, you know, very, um, 
very typical traditional strength training, you know, under a barbell or whatever that modality was to, to build strength. But we also Just used, don't say, don't say bench poles. <laughs> <laughs> no, no bench poles. We stopped doing those. That'll, um, that'll get us going. It'll be another hour before we're done here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Not a fan. Um, but, but another way that we incorporated work in the weight room was through these, these, um, you know, a metabolic conditioning pieces that are using all different kinds of movements, um, to push yourself to that red line kind of a moment. And the reason why I really loved those is because I had no expectation of them whatsoever. So we would put something together that was maybe a 10 minute piece of work where you're using different weights or body weight movements. Um, and you know, even sometimes hopping on the erg in there or the bike to throw in different mo movements in there, but you're, you have no, uh, you know, previous session that you've done that's exactly like this. So you don't know really what your pacing should be or um, what a good score is for this specific workout. And it's all about going off of feel and going off of how, how you know you're supposed to be thinking through a situation like this. So I, I would break them up into chunks a lot of times and say, okay, I'm halfway through this session. How am I supposed to feel halfway through a max effort piece regardless of what it is, right? Like if I don't feel that same sort of I'm, I'm hitting the pain wall and now I'm pushing through it sort of a feeling, then I'm not going hard enough and I need to continue to push. And and using that that as an opportunity to develop my my mental game as well as physical game. Yeah, perfect. And then it's it's backwards compatible as well because then you could take that new level that you've set in the weight room and say, oh, well, I could do this in the boat or on the erg now because I've done, I've worked this hard in the weight room and so 100%. this is how much I understand I can push myself. Yep, it, all, exactly. it, all, it all feeds into everything else and it's it's funny. I'm looking at your logo here on the screen as you're talking. It's the big circle with the oar on one side and the barbell on the other side. It's perfect for the whole, the whole analogy of the episode. Yep, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, so... Any more comments or specific skills anybody wants to mention before we move on to the next, our uh, final topic here? Because I know we're running long. Going once, uh -huh. going twice. Joe? No, I'm good. That's, that's oh. all I was going to say. All right, fine. Um, <laughs> so then, uh, Sarah, I had on yours specifically talking about some psych of returning from injury. This is an area that I really hope that we can get more information, more research out of it. Because right now, even in all of my sports psych books, it's like one chapter of the book is about mental skills that can help with returning from injury. So if you want to talk about in your overall training picture, I know, unfortunately, it's a topic that is way too familiar to you. Um, but if there was any like of the mental skills we've talked about today that have been particularly useful for you and what advice you'd offer anybody else um, who is returning from injury. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, I looked, I had two really big cycles of injuries that were tough. One was um, in the Olympic year 2011 leading into 2012, where I was dealing with a, a rib fracture and recurring rib problem. And then the other one was uh, 2014 to 15 uh, time period. And that was about another 12 month cycle um, that was, ended up being my hip and low back that I was dealing with. Um, and I thought that the actual Getting through the injury period was harder almost than um, once I was back and building back up because, um, it, you know, it's hard to feel like maybe you've been making progress um, and then all of a sudden you have to put the brakes on because you, this thing has popped up. Um, but what I realized uh, helped me the most, especially for that first rib break situation because I was with the national team and when I broke my rib, there were like five to seven other girls that were also hurt and were spending time on the bike at the at that uh, time, which is a whole other topic that you don't want me to get rant on. Um, but, but, but to see kind of, um, how my teammates were reacting to it as well, there was an array of emotions, you know, some were really, really down and negative and upset about it. And I recognized that that was happening and decided right off the bat that I was not going to let that be my mindset. I was not going to get negative. I was going to be as positive as I possibly could about the situation. And I truly believe that that helps me to recover faster. So by looking at this with as much optimism as possible and seeing it almost as an opportunity to work on things that I wouldn't be able to work on if I was fully healthy and going full steam ahead. So breaking my movement patterns back down at a very fundamental level and finding out why did this injury happen in the first place? I'm not just going to like heal what has happened and go right back to my same patterns, but what can I do to, to correct whatever issues caused me to get injured in the first place? And now I have to be slow enough 
you know, where I am in my training that I have the opportunity to build myself back up there. So I think having that mindset and that optimism really made a big difference. Um, and then I think the other big one, so once you come back from injury is the ability to break your timeline into smaller chunks. So, you know, it's scary to come back when you feel like you were doing a great job and you're making all this progress and then you are healthy again and you're ready to start erging or rowing and you're looking at all your teammates and you can see how far behind you are from all of them. Um, I think that can get really scary if you if you try to rush that process or you think that you have to be ready and back as quickly as possible rather than really looking at how much time you have to improve and get to where you need to get and taking it one small manageable chunk at a time. Um, I think that really, really helped me, especially in the last cycle, the 2014, 2015 period where I was hurt because I, I was thinking to myself, essentially think about how many times you've made huge leaps of progress in just a month or two. And you actually have, you know, a year and a half or so to go and you're going to be completely healthy through that whole rest of that, of that period now, because you're not going to let injury come in again. Um, you can make these big jumps in a month or two period and you don't have to be all of a sudden ready tomorrow. Um, uh, and I think that that made a big difference for me as well. Um, just, you know, controlling the progress that I could and, and not expecting more of myself than really made sense for that current moment. Great. Thanks. That's, that's a lot to think about as far as uh, practical advice. But I appreciate that. Blake, did you have something you want to say? Yeah, just going to add to that. I think a lot of times when people get hurt, they, they exclude themselves from the team. I, I personally did. I excluded myself from the team. And then you, you go, you're going to all these doctors and you're trying to figure out what's wrong with you. And the first thing they say is like, just rest and, and take these drugs. Um, and you know, now that I know a little bit more, if you just find what they can do that's pain free and work on their issue at the time, they're going to stay so much more positive and they're going to recover quite a bit faster. And a lot of that has to do with mindset, but also just realizing that, you know, they're not completely broken and there are things that they can do while they work on their issues, um, keeps them in a really positive mindset and it's going to get them back much sooner. Yeah. And, and we're athletes, you know, we got into this because we wanted to move and be active and push ourselves. So you have to give those people some sort of other outlet or they're just going to go stir crazy and end up hurting themselves again. Um, I've got one of my rowers, um, had a hernia repair at the end of last fall season. It was supposed to be, you know, he, he just made all the improvement for coming back from the summer. It's his, it's his senior year. This is going to be his whole thing. Um, and then he had his hernia, had to get it repaired. It was supposed to be good by the time that winter training started again. Um, and so he was like, all right, well, you know, the doctor says just rest for the first. I was like, no, 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 no. Like get exactly what you can't do. And it turned out that really what he couldn't do was, you know, heavy, heavy lifting or things on his feet that would involve supporting through the abs. So I had him over to my uh, home, home gym garage thing. Um, and we did all of the things that I could think of that didn't involve uh, transferring tension basically from his upper body to his lower body. So that was really what, what he couldn't do. So this was his opportunity to, just like you guys have been talking about, work on his uh, external rotators, which had been weak. And so he was throwing his shoulder out at the catch, work on all this other stuff that he could still do. But the doctors had said, just like you said, Blake, oh, just rest. It's like, well, like there's so much more that you could do that actually turns this. So I loved what you said about turning it into just a, a differently motivating time. Yeah, it's not as much fun as actually doing your sport, but you can still find motivation in that process. Yeah, I totally agree with all of that. And not only does staying active and moving through that period of injury help you mentally, but it also helps you physically. You're getting more blood flow to those areas that are trying to heal. Um, and I wish that I had known that when I was sitting on the bike with rib fractures because I wouldn't have been so fearful of doing nothing with my upper body during that, that you know six week period that I was recovering. I think I would have come back even quicker had I known that it was okay to actually do some activity with my upper body as long as it was the smart and the correct things um, because because of that blood flow. 
Yeah, and he was actually able to make big improvements because he had four weeks where he had to just focus on, Joe, like you said, the things that he was bad at that he didn't want to do, right? Like he had four weeks where he was like, shoot, I guess all I could do now are, you know, bat wings and external rotator cuff exercises and, you know, <laughs> all the stuff that's really easy to minimize when you're also doing the rest of your sport. All right, we are just about coming up on 90 minutes here. So why don't we get any any last words on mental skills training, any any last comments or parting advice for our audience, and then we will wrap this monster up and get ready to put the show notes out tomorrow. Uh, Blake, you want to start us off? Yeah, just say um, be aware of, of what your mindset is, and, and when it's negative, try to catch yourself where you are and, and cut it off right away. Um, Set yourself up for success. Um, enjoy, enjoy the training pro pro uh, process, and um, be progressive. Good, Joe. Uh, I'm going to keep it really simple, and I would. I'll just say that identify, you know, one thing that you know of uh, in terms of an area you can improve on, uh, and work on that area. Uh, mentally, so whether that's establishing a, 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 a good warm-up routine or pre pre-race routine, um, you know, doing visualization exercises, identify an area that you can improve on and make it a habit and practice it. Yeah, I, I I posted a link before this to the the talk with the sports psychologist from Michigan or Michigan State. Um, saying like how important like if you had to put a percentage on it how how much is rowing mental and you could come up with whatever number that is and then ask yourself what percentage of your training time then do you spend training mental skills and is it even remotely close to the amount that you would say it's mental so i love treating mental skills training just like physical skills training not necessarily in equal amounts but treating it the same way as just another form of practice that's great sarah um, yeah, the only thing I would really add to what we've already discussed is just uh, if you are an athlete that is struggling mentally with something or, you know, or having anxiety about a certain topic or erg test or race, um, writing down a list of all the things that are, are building you that anxiety or that fear and putting them into two categories, those things that are completely out of your control and the things that are in your control. And then once you come up with that list of what's out of your control, crossing them off and completely erasing them from your mind and only focusing on what's in your control. Uh, because once you can free yourself from those, those external factors that really are not going to change no matter how much you might wish they will, um, that's when I think you start to give yourself the opportunity to really improve and take your performance to the next level. And, and that's an absolute life skill too, right? Yep, for sure. I do it all the time, to be honest, yeah. <laughs> about like certain things that are coming up or are keeping me up at night, writing a list of stuff that, you know, what what can I actually do to make the situation better and what can I just let go of? Yep. Yeah. yep. And that's I'm, probably my my biggest takeaway from all this is just the, the power of positivity. I mean, not to, not to get all kind of woo-woo and kumbaya about it, but uh, I mean, just, just the power of self-belief and making sure that your inner narrative is positive, and if it's not, finding ways to correct it um, and, and to get yourself on track for a success and performance mindset. So uh, thank you, everybody, for listening. Uh, whether you are wrapping up winter training now or getting ready for spring racing or since today was the crash bees, uh, if you blew up, then I hope that you are getting something out of this that you can apply right away in your training. Uh, we hope to be doing another roundtable in the next month or two, so stay tuned for that, and thanks for listening. Good night.